Assalamu alaikum everyone. On behalf of EK Foundation for Science, Culture and Education, I would like to welcome you all for your gracious like you know attendance and making the event auspicious with your presence here. And without any long introduction, I will just very shortly introduce EK Foundation before you and our co-organizers, which is Gav and Droplets of Mercy. We do have representatives from both of the organizations here. Uh, as we, you know that, you know, the book talk would be delivered by uh, our esteemed author, Professor Dr. Khalid Beydoun himself. Did I pronounce it right? Yes, you got it. MashaAllah. So, uh, the book is about American Islamophobia. Before I switch into it, am I audible to everyone? Yeah, this is the voice Okay. So, basically, where we're sitting in, it's UK Foundation. The Foundation stands for UK Foundation for Science, Culture, and Education. It's been involved for several years now, but it's constituent organizations, which are the associations and research centers working under it. And they've been working for more than three decades now. So we do have like you know some work experience we can say. So in one line that we can say our aim is to head towards the future in line with our principles and small institutions which we have. Uh, very shortly, Foundation for Science, Culture, and Education in is an organization that produces knowledge and devises public <coughs> policy and strategy through its prestigious and strong institutions that include associations. We have got three associations. They are Yekter, Ilan, and Nikia. And we have got four research centers working directly under us according to the fields of their works. They are uh, Todam, Ikam, Ipam, and STA. And I'll shortly tell you what they stand for. We have got certain values, and I will not go into the detail to try to put it, you know, crisp and brief, inshallah. Of course. Uh, so, coming to our research centers, we have got uh, four research centers that you can see on the screen over there. Uh, first of them is ECOM. ECOM is the research center uh, that works for Islamic economics and finance studies. Then we have ECOM, and ECOM works for education policy and education studies. STA works for civil society studies, and Trudal is uh, the research centers under whose domain today's activity falls. And this is the uh, research center for social thought and policy. And very briefly, its aim is uh, to create a fair, righteous, and prosperous society, and it investigates the problems faced by Muslim societies in particular Turkey, including their nature and interconnectivity, and suggests concrete solutions to these problems by combining the experiences from the Turkish society and the Muslim world. So obviously, you know, in this domain, in this area, in this arena, we've got certain activities which we are performing. Uh, coming to our esteemed uh, author, you know, who has graced today's occasion with his presence. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, he warrants a very longer introduction, but, you know, just the formality, we will try to suffice, uh, you know, this even. The shorter, the better. That is <laughs> so, Professor Dr. Khalid Beydoun is a law professor, author, and public intellectual. He serves as a law professor at Wine State University, a scholar in residence at the Berkman Klein Center at Howard University, and associate director of the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights in Detroit. Professor Beydoun is author of the critically acclaimed book, American Islamophobia, Understanding the Roots and Rise of Fear, and co-editor uh, co of Islamophobia and the Law, which is published by the University of Cambridge Press. Uh, Prof, with your permission then, uh, I mean obviously again, uh, Prof himself would explain about his role, which is going to be talked today. So, just to reflect upon, you know, the kind of work it is, uh, we can just uh, see one of the reviews from, uh, uh, you know, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, if I'm again pronouncing it right, who is from Columbia Law School. Uh, she said about the book that if this compelling book is an exquisite testament to what it means to subvert Islamophobia, Bedun stands out as a brilliant, brilliant scholar and advocate who gives voice and attention to the neglected stories. Uh, I won't take much more time, but just to introduce our co-organizers, we have got co-organizer GAP, which is uh, the Migration Research Foundation. Uh, it was established in 2010 with the objective of conducting research on social, cultural, and political issues uh, related to the Turkish diaspora. And 
Gap takes responsibility for engaging in research, publication, and education activities on issues of migration to Turkey. Migration is examined multidimensionally with all social, economic, cultural, and political dimensions. And uh, an, uh, a very important work which they have got is their publishing house that was established in 2020, and probably that has produced the Turkish translation of Professor Bridner's book. Uh, GAP proudly publishes the only journal focused on diaspora in Tur Turkey. From the Turkish Journal of Diaspora Studies, some of the copies probably are available over here. Our second co organization, uh, co organizer for today's event is uh, Droppers of Mercy. So we have got a uh, very esteemed guest from that group as well. It is a Canadian non profit organization that aims to help the Uyghurs, Syrians, and Afghans. Uh, they build homes for Syrian refugees, they build wells in Afghanistan, and they have got education centers in Turkey for Uyghurs, and they also help widows, orphans, uh, in improving their uh, living situation. It is currently in Turkey, uh, this Canadian organization, along with our esteemed professor, in order to raise funds and to see various projects and programs taking place. And now onwards, I would uh, you know, hand over the rostrum to you, and after the prof explains shortly about his book, mm -hmm. then we'll move to a moderated session along with Merve Hanu. Hanu. Uh, she will moderate the session where she will ask questions to the professor, and then we'll open the house for questions, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Can, I, can I stand up? Is that okay? Assalamu alaikum, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be in Istanbul. I, I really want to thank Ilke and I want to thank Perspective for um, hosting this event tonight in Droplets of Mercy, giving us an opportunity to discuss a topic of interest to me, obviously, as a scholar who's been examining uh, Islamophobia now for 20 years, to be honest with you, for first a decade as an activist and then as an attorney. And over the last decade as a uh, law professor, but also as a public commentator and public intellectual. We have room, come in. Hey, it's not like brother, how are you? It's a good brother right there, if you guys. Sorry for being here. So uh, what I want to do is I, I want to use the book, American Islamophobia, Understanding the Roots and Rise of Fear, as a springboard for a broader conversation on global Islamophobia. Right, obviously what's happening on a global scale is in many respects a consequence, a result of what the American War on Terror did over the last 20 years. Um, but what we're experiencing and witnessing on a real-time basis with regard to Islamophobia across the world represents, it manifests how Islamophobia is distinctly unleashed, how it's distinctly experienced, and how it's distinctly and diversely Readapting to many of the challenges Muslim uh, populations across the world face. So I want to spend roughly maybe 15 minutes giving you guys a broad-based overview uh, of how I think about Islamophobia from a legal, political, sociological perspective. Then transition during the second half of my presentation, talking about what I consider to be some of the most nefarious, threatening Islamophobic campaigns taking place across the world. And then, inshallah, during the latter end, engage in the Q&A. Um, and then uh, after the Q&A with the moderator, have a broad-based discussion with all of you. I'm not going to use the PowerPoint much because I'm feeling, I'm, I had some coffee, and I feel, I feel good. So I'm going to just speak, speak from the heart, right? So just, just to be really brief, so I grew up in Detroit. Anybody know where Detroit is? Of course. Detroit is the motor city. It's the capital of the Arab, the Muslim American the African-American experience, it's a city that holds a lot of gravitas with regard to the minority experience in the United States, right? So growing up in Detroit, you kind of have no choice but to be an activist. I'm an activist in terms of racial justice, social justice, but specifically after 9-11, Islamophobia. And I'm a Muslim kid, I grew up in a Muslim-majority community in Detroit, and much of my life, I was conditioned to be conscious of what was taking place in the broader Muslim world, right? Palestine, Iraq, 9-11 takes place, and then Muslims become public enemy number one. In the United States, but also public enemy number one. In Europe, the West at large, but also beyond the West in Asia, Sub-Saharan African countries, East Asia, 
The American war on terror was gallivanting, galloping across the world, trying to convince governments, right, that Islam is an evil, a violent, a terroristic religion, right, and persuading populations across the world that expressions of Muslim identity, that freely exercising your Muslim identity, raises suspicion of terrorism. And really briefly in the United States, I know many of you guys don't like the United States, I'm very critical of the United States myself, right? Uh, I'm sure the FBI, the CIA, and the LAPD, and the NYPD got me, got me in their books, right? They got me in their, they're sliding in my DMs all the time. Um, the fixation on Muslim identity post 9-11 did not invent anti-Muslim animus. It did not invent Islamophobia but it intensified it, it exacerbated it, right? On a popular level, on a policing level. So we see a new system of Islamophobic discourse, of Islamophobic policing, of Islamophobic prosecution taking place in the post 9-11 context because it becomes the domestic project of the United States Right, to conflate, to integrate Muslim identity expressions of Islam with terrorism. As a consequence of that, and I'm going to provide you with my definition of Islamophobia tied to law, we see structural Islamophobia, the architecture of Islamophobic policy being established in the United States with regard to domestic governance and policing, the quote-unquote national security counter-terror state, but we also see it being exported. America is no sort of negligible, minimal government. It's the world's superpower, right? It's the global bully. So what the United States wants, it oftentimes gets because it, throw, it throws its economic and political weight. So Islamophobia is a domestic American project. That's the focus of the first book. But it's also a global project, which is the focus of my next book that, inshallah, I want to figure it out. So it's critical when understanding Islamophobia to break it down into three dimensions, right? Many of us know what Islamophobia is generally, and in the media context, in the political discourses, even the academic discourses, not only in the United States, but in Europe, Turkey, the Arab-speaking world, only thought about Islamophobia in very narrow terms, right? They classified Islamophobia as bigotry, fear, suspicion, animus toward Muslims that was being enacted or enforced by individuals. Hate mongers, bigots, racists, in France, secularists, in Turkey too, secularists. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's the, not, you know, not the governmental camera looking at me, but... <laughs> But we'll talk about a bit uh, more about that in terms of how Islamophobia is readapted and sort of adjusted in uh, different contexts. So the state is a major culprit of Islamophobia, right? We see this through policies in the United States, like counter radicalization policing, the Muslim ban, the Patriot Act. Any Americans in the room? Right? Patriot Act was this landmark legislation passed in the immediate wake of the 9-11 terror attacks which enabled the, st the state to surveil, to spy on Muslim households, masajid, Muslim student organizations, to install wiretaps, but also to follow the, the bank activity, the travel histories and activity of Muslims. Unprecedented, right? This was unprecedented in American history. I teach constitutional law, and I can tell you that violated a range of constitutional protections. So the state is a major culprit and catalyst of Islamophobia, even beyond the United States, right? We look at what's happening in places like France, right? An <coughs> emblematic example of structural Islamophobia is the headscarf ban, the niqab ban, right? Now they want to ban hijab in sports. And alhamdulillah, uh, Marine Le Pen lost, but Macron is not much better, right? And the trajectory of where things are going politically in France, you know, highlight the, the strong possibility of the nationalists, you know, the, the Front National, the Islamophobic party, probably winning in the next decade, right? And this, this populism is happening on a global scale. So we have private Islamophobia, Islamophobia coming from individuals. We have structural Islamophobia, 
right, which are these various architectures, legal architectures of Islamophobia being established and expanded by states, by governments, being spearheaded by the United States, kind of the global cheerleader, if you will, of the war on terror. And then most importantly, we have dialectical Islamophobia that undergirds both of this, both of these dimensions. It's this sort of tether, this bridge that connects private Islamophobia with state-endorsed or state-sponsored structural Islamophobia. And dialectical Islamophobia is this ongoing discourse, this ongoing communique between the state, which by way of passing law, policy, state action, rhetoric from presidents and prime ministers, endorsing the idea that Islam is terroristic and expressions of Muslim identity are tied to terrorism, that communicates to the citizens, right, non-Muslims, that you have to be suspicious of Muslims too. It's your duty. By virtue of you being a patriot, let's say hypothetically you live in France, right? And you're a non-Muslim, you're a secularist, right? If, if a law is embedded on this cornerstone idea that Muslim identity is tethered to suspicion and terrorism, then you are not a good Frenchwoman, you're not a good patriot, if you're not engaged in this process of prosecuting, punishing, and policing Muslims. In the United States, we call it see something, say something. But this phenomenon is not unique to the United States alone. It's a global phenomenon. And we can think about this dialectic and communicate being established by one of my heroes, Edward Said. Anybody knows who Edward Said is? Brother, you raise your hand. Give us a... I'm going to put you on the spot. You wrote this famous book called Orientalism, right? What, what does he say in Orientalism? <coughs> what he said, what I, I started to read the book, but I read just 50 pages. It's a hard book. It was hard to read and understand. That's why I stopped it now. But what he said there is mostly to, to see themselves as Western countries, as the highest level of people, Beautiful. and they try to omit the Western countries. Yeah. Mostly he focused on Egypt because he spent some years in his life in Egypt. Mm -hmm. As they try to omit like the civilization of the Arab countries or maybe the Far Eastern countries. Excellent. Yeah. So Edward Said was Palestinian. Yeah. Educated in Egypt, right? What he said was Western civilization, Western governments, Western politicians, Western artists. Western writers, Western novelists, Western uh, tastemakers, everybody in the West, Europe primarily, right, at this juncture, then the United States, we have American Orientalism, began to define themselves in mirror opposite terms of the Muslim world. So if the West was where democracy flourished, then the Muslim world had to be perpetually at war. If the West was where liberalism, right, and freedom, and modernity, was vibrant, then the Middle East had to be static, backward, savage, right? If the West was a bastion of peace, right, then the Middle East had to be in this, like, entrenched in this never-ending process of war. This was written, this was entrenched, this was deepened in the art that we saw in museums, in the literature that we read as children in the laws that were enacted well before 9-11, in the discourses that were used to justify colonialism in places like Algeria, in Palestine, right? In Kashmir. Centuries ago, embedding the stereotype through this system, this discourse of Orientalism, that Muslims were violent, warmongering, patriarchal, oppressive. And these baselines, these you know, disfigured understandings of who Muslims were are redeployed in the post-9-11 context to facilitate and then make it easily disseminable, disseminable to, to convince people that Muslims are terrorists. So Orientalism is the mother of Islamophobia. You cannot understand the reach, the resonance, how deep-seated, how deeply rooted Islamophobia is until you grapple with Orientalism. I want to close soon, but before closing, again, and th this is let me a, a quick personal story. So the, the reason I wrote this book, American Islamophobia, is because um, anybody know critical race theory? What critical race theory is? A few people. So I, I'm a critical race theorist, right? Which means that I study race and religion really closely 
in the United States. And in the United States, in the post-9-11 context, everybody was convinced, everybody was, was sort of centering on the black experience, the Latinx experience, marginalized groups. But I'm like, why isn't nobody talking about Muslims? This is the war on terror. This is 9-11 America. You can make the case that Muslims are as oppressed as anybody else. So I wanted to write a book. I wanted to produce knowledge and produce thought production that brought to light the experience of Muslims, not only in the United States, but on a global scale, right? Because we're a transnational community. We're citizens of distinct countries, right? But our links are tied to faith and our experiences are often tied, especially with the global war on terror, with what's happening on a global scale. So before I close, right, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the global Islamophobic campaigns that I find to be the most salient and the most destructive. We see what's happening in real time in places like India, right, home to 220 million Muslims, second or third greatest population of Muslims. Uh, I'm getting hot, so I'm gonna take this off, my apologies. Uh, in the world, thank you, buddy. But instead of white supremacy, like in the United States, being the principal spearhead of Islamophobia, unlike secularism, tied to white supremacy being the engine of Islamophobia in places like France, right? In India, it's Hindu supremacy. What's funny about Hindu supremacy is this. If you ask anybody on the street, especially in the West, what you think of Hinduism, oh, it's a passive, loving religion. They like to do yoga, yeah. <laughs> namaste, they're hugging you all that stuff, right? And they say Muslims are perpetually violent, but the, the script is flipped in India, right? Hindu thought, Hindu supremacy, right, has been the engine, has been the fuel propagating what I consider to be one of the more destructive Islamophobic campaigns in the world, right? So what we're seeing right now in real time in India, obviously, is Hindu supremacy is being used to fully annex Kashmir. Kashmir has many analogs with Palestine, but it's seldom addressed in the popular media, entirely ignored. What's, so I wrote this article in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago. Everybody, every news station, every news outlet in Europe, the United States, um, and beyond, made a huge fuss about the Russians marching into Ukraine. And you know we can argue that it's justifiable or not, right? Everybody and their mama, after the Russian invasion, became an advocate for Ukrainian self-determination. But nobody cared when Modi marched into Kashmir in 2019 in the next Kashmir by force. Why is that? Because the victims were Muslims. Muslims are only newsworthy when we're villains, not victims. And that's a principal reason why Modi has been able to expand an Islamophobic regime in India. We obviously know what's happening in East Turkestan, we've been here with our good brother Abdel Rashid, taking us to Uber households, political organizations across the city here in Istanbul. In my opinion, the most destructive case of Islamophobia in the world. If you were to ask me, what is the one issue that is the most frightening when it comes to global Islamophobia, I would tell you the case of Uber Muslims. Concentration camps, five million people in concentration camps, organ harvesting. Throwing young children, many of whom we've met during these last couple days, into brainwashing orphanages, looking, classifying Muslim identity, Islam, as a mental illness that the state has to rid children of. There's no due process, there's no, demo there's no democracy, there's no freedom of religion in East Turkestan and China. Ramadan's been banned. If you speak, if you speak, if you if you assume, if you fast for Ramadan, you're going to get punished. If you wear hijab, you're going to get you're going to get persecuted. The most destructive Islamophobic campaign in the world, but largely un, under, underrepresented and underreported in the mainstream media. I think that I was one of the first people in the West to talk about this issue in 2018, right? And I'm still sort of I'm very disappointed by the degree of neglect that this issue was received. France, obviously, right? We can talk about France all day long, and I'm happy to talk about it for weeks if you guys want. But I consider the French, even though the United States is the, the global superpower, the French are the vanguard of Islamophobia. I think that they're a really telling bellwether barometer for where Islamophobia is going in the future. Before 9-11 and the terror attacks, Muslims were already public enemy number one 
in France. They, were, they tried to ban the headscarf in the 80s, in the 90s. Many prime ministers and presidents said, the schools are aware we have to rake Islam up because that's where we condition and cultivate future citizens. Right? And we see what's happening in France by way of structural Islamophobic policy, right, the enactment. And there's a gender dimension to it as well, right? I want to focus on gendered Islamophobia and how Western states specifically, right, police Muslim identity by policing Muslim women's bodies. So we can talk about how Muslim women in the West are oftentimes the principal victims of Islamophobia, right? And I'll close on this note. They want to save Muslim women when they go to war in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, but then they ignore Muslim women when it comes to civil liberties and civil rights in Western democracies in the West. So I'm going to shut up and stop there, and I'm really excited to have a, inshallah, very dynamic Q&A with the sister, and then all of you, please, you know, any questions and comments that you have, please share them. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Americans are very loud. So. <laughs> uh, what, what, what was the perception of Muslims in the media during the Trump yes. moment? Um, so and the intensity as well. The intensity, yeah. So tr Trump, whether you like or hate Trump, one thing you have to give him is that he was very effective in weaponizing social and mainstream media uh, to advance his campaign. Let me give you, an, I'll give you an example. So. December 7th, 2015 is a date every Muslim should know, especially Muslim Americans, because I'm, I remember that day like yesterday. On that day, I was, I was drinking coffee at home, and then I turned on the news, and Trump uh, announced the Muslim man, right? And he was really intelligent in organizing a huge press conference at a major um, election site, pre-election site, to announce this proposal. And at this juncture, December, on December 6th, 2017, Trump was not winning. People thought that he was somebody who would have no chance of winning the presidency, right? But on December 7th, when he made this proposal of the Muslim man, his favorability rating skyrocketed. He was intelligent in realizing that one way in which he could market not only himself as a candidate, but marketing what I think to be the centerpiece of his campaign, which was Islamophobia, 
using not only mainstream media, and this was televised by everybody, this proposal, by the way, and it was news for at least two weeks. It was front page news for roughly two weeks that Trump said something, what did he say? We're gonna stop immigration, we're gonna stop Muslim immigration into the United States until we know what was what is going on. That was a direct quote, and it became the Muslim ban. And the Muslim ban became the centerpiece of the news conversation for the months during the remainder of the election. And then he used that, that sloganeering, you know, he said things like Islam hates us, um, Syrian refugees are ISIS, uh, we have to go to war with Iran. So doing all this anti-Muslim sloganeering in the mainstream media, but also social media. Trump was very effective on platforms like Twitter. He was intelligent to realize that young people we're not watching CNN. They weren't watching Fox and MSNBC and BBC and TRT anymore. They're on social media. And he capitalized on that to deliver and to amplify his message. So social media is a great thing, right, in many respects. But it's also a destructive thing when we look at how the Trump administration really wielded and weaponized it as a way to, to mobilize and galvanize his supporters. But the other dimension of uh, his media utilization was... It incited a lot of hate crimes, right? When individuals were reading his tweets, especially white supremacists and Islamophobes and xenophobes, they took that, and this is uh, dialectical Islamophobia, they took that as a message to go out and attack Muslims you see in your midst. So many of you might remember that in that, a couple months after that, these uh, three Muslim students were killed at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, right? Because of the intensity um, of the media, the anti-Muslim rhetoric in the media. So very destructive. Oh, for the second question. Actually, the second question is um, connected, with, connected with the first one. Uh, how do you see uh, the Biden um, management here? Like, um, how does Biden manage uh, all this um, hatred uh, on Muslims and Islamophobia? That, that, did it change or... Um, what's your thoughts about this? Okay, so I'll give, you, I'll give you a metaphor, right? So Trump is a pig without a blanket on him. Biden is a pig with a blanket on him. So we know Trump is a pig because there's no blanket on him. But Biden is essentially doing the exact same thing. But we don't know exactly, like he uses nice words, we have to make peace, we have to bring Muslims into the government. But the policies themselves are, are one and the same, right? The Biden administration is still droning Muslim-majority countries. The Biden administration is still enabling and abetting the Zionist regime in Palestine. The Biden administration is still continuing Muslim surveillance in the United States. The Biden regime is doing nothing uh, with regard to the persecution of Muslims in India. Nothing to the persecution of Uber in China. Right? So the dress, the dressing has changed, but the, the results and the consequences are essentially the same. And um, what kind of image emerges when groups like women and black people who are already exposed to many discriminations are considered from the perspective of, of Islamophobia? Well, look, I live in the United States, right? So when you talk about Islamophobia in the United States, you have to talk about the black experience. The, the biggest plurality of Muslims in the United States are black, right? More than Arab, more than South Asians, more than anybody else. And, and black Muslims were the first Muslims in the United States. Many of you may not know, and I talk about this in my book, uh, enslaved Africans who came to the United States were working on plantations, right? 15 to 30 percent of them were Muslims, right? So the Muslim experience must always begin with discussing uh, the black experience. So when we talk about, and in the United States we have a lot of issues, anti-black racism obviously being one of them, right? Islamophobia and anti-black racism intersect all the time. You, so the, um, the, the recommendation from Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, my mentor, she's the mother of this term intersectionality. You guys know this term, intersectionality? Very popular term. So when anti-black racism and Islamophobia intersect, uh, they have a very destructive uh, consequence on black Muslims. So all these things converge, right? Muslims aren't only Arab, Muslims aren't only Turk, Muslims aren't only uh, Middle Eastern. Islam is a universal religion and it's represented by people of all races and ethnicities. Yeah. 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 Y
so there is another question. Uh, this is actually my question, uh, personally. Uh, my foundation and uh, I are generally focused on um, diasporic communities and they're generally based on Europe. And uh, when you uh, are um, work working on, on diasporic communities, uh, especially with Muslim identity, uh, you're seeing um, the struggles they are having is generally and mostly based on their Muslim identity. And um, especially European countries that have well-established diaspora communities researching Muslim identity have been trying to create a, a, an Islam that would serve their uh, interests, their country's interests for years. And uh, there are concepts like French Islam or German Islam, we are yeah. hearing about them every day on TV channels or it's the life of uh, these, these kind of diaspora communities. So, um, is it possible to talk about an American Islam? And if so, what kind of effect does this have for American Islamophobia? Yeah, that's a you know that's a very intricate question. Um, and you're exactly right. In Europe, there's been a, a very intentional effort on the part of governments to innovate and adapt to them in ways that align with. Um, state, no state interest. France specifically, I think, is the most lucid example. So France has an official French masjid. Uh, France has imams that are on their payroll. France has shut down a lot of masjid uh, throughout the country uh, that have not chosen to sort of play ball or you know sort of you know adopt the form of Islam uh, that is palatable or that is aligned with French interests. Does anybody know who Derek Bell is? Derek Bell, a very prominent uh, American scholar, law scholar, he, he, he has this thesis which really aligns with, sort of goes to the spirit of the question you're asking, that uh, racial or religious progress only happens in the West when it aligns with majoritarian interests, right? So in places like France, Germany, and also the United States, and I'll address the United States question more closely in a bit, um, is the, the scope of tolerance of Islam is only as broad as uh, it aligns or is confined within broader secular or, U or European or white interests. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Right? And that, it, 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 when it goes beyond that, right, then Islam will be, will be policed and persecuted. Right? And we see this in, in France, we see this in Germany. Did you guys see what happened in Germany a couple of days ago? So they restricted any protests related to Palestine yeah, that's true. until yeah. I believe it was like May 1st and they extended yeah. it uh, yeah. because of uh, Shireen Ali yeah. Hamas' death, yeah. right? So there's also the sloppy conflation in Europe between, it's Orientalism of course, Arab identity, Palestinian, pro-Palestinian speech with Islamophobia. In the United States there's been a, it's, it's a more difficult sort of process and project to invent an American Islam, and I'll explain why that is. Um, but there's been attempts by the various administrations in the post 9-11 uh, context. And uh, during the Bush administration, the Bush administration, we all know, was the, the principal architect and the engineer of yeah. the counter-terror state in, in the United States. Um, there was this discussion of the good and the bad Muslim, yeah. which rises specifically from the work of a Harvard-trained scholar by the name of Samuel Huntington. You guys know Samuel Huntington? He wrote this... Really famous but trashy book, yeah. exactly. The Clash of Civilizations, and the thesis behind that book was Western countries are inevitably going to engage in war with the Muslim world, right? And he wrote, it was first an article in 1994 yeah. in Foreign Policy Magazine, became a book in 1996. So, um, you know, imperialists kind of look at Samuel Huntington as being some sort of a Islamophobic prophet, you know what I mean? Um, but it is the version of American Islam that was constructed on the back of the Clash of Civilizations this good versus bad Muslim binary that was being propagated by the Bush administration was good Muslims do things that American patriots do. They wave a flag on their home, right? They practice Islam in a way that is palatable to the state, right? Yeah. They're not critical of US foreign policy. In fact, not only not being critical of American policy, they're engaged with American foreign policy. They work as soldiers, they work as translators in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, right? They're suspicious of distinct forms of Muslim expression and identity, right? Movements like uh, Salafism, for instance, right? Or uh, the Ikhwan, Muslim Brotherhood, they're very suspicious of that. Um, Mahmoud Mandani, another American-trained professor, wrote a great book called Good Muslims, Bad Muslims, which breaks this down. The Obama administration, you know, Obama is heralded as being this progressive hero of 
you know, harmony between the Muslim world in the West readjusts the invention of American Islam by saying, we want to bring you in as native informants. We want to bring you in as cogs in this broader Islamophobic machine to function as um, individuals working for the Department of Justice, the executive branch, the legislative branch, or the CGUS informants in the Sajid. Right? That's why we have this expansion of counter-radicalization policing. Anybody from the UK? So in the UK, it's called a pro it's program called Prevent. The idea that law enforcement works closely with members of the Muslim community who are the eyes and ears of the state to keep tabs on Muslims that the state is suspicious of. And being a good Muslim, according to the Obama administration and liberal uh, iterations of Islamophobia, is to be part of the broader project of surveilling Muslims, to find the bad guys. And Trump and these populists, they do away with all these sort of inconspicuous sensibilities and say all of Islam is bad, right? Sort of re-embellish and reignite the clash of civilizations rhetoric. But no, it's, it's always been a, and it's distinct across states, obviously, uh, to reinvent and adapt Islam in ways that are palatable to the whole state's interests. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kaidu. Um, I think we are done with the questions on top of my uh, publishing house. Um, in order to give more space to our audience. Thank you so much. So actually, we can uh, thank you for the <clears throat> comprehensive uh, lecture. You know, we talk about the first thing. I think everything has been addressed, but still, we open the house for questions. So if you have any questions from the participants, we can we can have Brother Anas with the mic. Or if somebody can speak without the microphone, we can start with him. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much. It was a solid brief. Um, my question is more to do with the understanding of you know like um, activism, but also because mainly everyone here is young. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to ask, how do you see? Because um, I'm I'm trying to be focused on the solution rather than the problem itself. Uh, what we're talking about are symptoms. I want to address the sickness itself, the roots. What do you think young people can do uh, in order to be part of the solution? That's number one. And number two is, how do we take a proactive stance? In the Quran, Allah says, um, This was also like a principle that was um, applied in the time of the Prophet So I'm trying to like, you know, get inspired from the Sira, from the, from the story of uh, our Prophet Muhammad And uh, how do you see a way out where we can push back with what's better and be part of the solution. Like, is there any light you see? Because also you're like a law professor, so you know, like, um, I'm sure you, you, know, you would have like many of you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I do have optimism. The reason I have optimism is because of, it's because of young people, right? I think young people are far more vocal and far more vigilant in combating uh, Islamophobia in ways that my generation wasn't. You know, my generation in the post 9 11 context was very fearful, especially in the West. They didn't want to be critical of American, British, Canadian, um, French, German policy because as a consequence of them being critical, there's the prospect of them being surveilled and policed. Then there was a stronger uh, effort on their part to want to assimilate into American culture and European culture. I don't see young people, there's still that taking place, I think, in the West. But there's also a rising tide. Uh, an emergent trend among Muslims, even in the West, to reject the promise of assimilation in the West, right? To reject the notion that, as a consequence of being Muslim, you're never going to, you know, garner the benefits of whiteness in America. You're never going to garner the privileges of being fully French or German in European countries. Uh, but also the resurgence of Muslim identity, right? The idea that, look, Malcolm X said it best. He said that, if you police me and persecute me more, that's going to make me more black and more Muslim, right? And that's taking place with Muslims today. One of the positive aspects of victimization and marginalization is that you rise up, especially proud people. You become more proud of who you are. That's why the incidence of hijab in places like France, even though there's hexcarp fans, is increasing. That's why Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States, despite the global war on terror, right? So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. People meet me all the time. They're like, 
professor on social media, when I read your book, you sound like this really angry dude. But when I meet you, you're smiling and laughing, right? Because I'm really optimistic because of the energy I get from my students as law students, but also when speaking to young students like yourselves. There's this real fearlessness and courage amongst young people, specifically young Muslims, in the West and Muslim-majority countries like Turkey, to say that we're going to be proud of who we are as Muslims, we're going to speak up against what's happening against us in our communities, right? And also to utilize the laws that we have in the West. I teach constitutional law. And how can America be, be serious about being a democracy when it says, oh, you know, we're going to give you all free speech, free exercise of religion, the ability to freely assembly, to freely assemble with members of your religious community, but we're not going to do, we're not going to do all that to Muslims. That's an indictment on American democracy, right? So for me, what I tell people is, and you know, look, I'm American, and I tell people, American doesn't mean white, yeah. right? American doesn't, it doesn't even mean Native American, in all due respect to my Native American brothers and sisters, right? What America means aspirationally is these principles in the Constitution, which extend these rights. So if America wants to be America, let everybody, regardless of their race and religion, practice these rights in ways that you promise. Otherwise, your Constitution is BS or trash, right? And I think that uh, the question of what we can do, and I, I entirely agree with you, like, we, we can't always be critical, we can't always condemn, we have to be prescriptive, meaning we have to find solutions. But one thing I tell students all the time is, we can't move toward prescriptions and solutions, especially in the social media generation, right? Everybody wants to be an advocate or a champion on a specific human rights or civil rights issue, and that's great, I love that. But before you, became, before you can look for a solution and become a champion on an issue, you have to know that issue. You have to be literate and fluent and research that issue. Because there can't be prescriptions and solutions if we're spreading misinformation ourselves, right? So knowledge, truly mastering and thoroughly investigating a subject, whether it be Islamophobia, whether it be racism, racial injustice, what's happening politically in Turkey, the first step of finding a solution is knowledge. If you don't have knowledge, then you can't actually march toward a prescription and solution. From this brother. Uh, what I want to ask is uh, mostly related to the root of Islamophobia. Because many countries, maybe you can say powerful countries, they will not invest in something which they do not have a profit or benefit from. The main reason I start because I focus on what's the root of Islamophobia. Maybe in post in post 9/11, maybe uh, <laughs> terrorism and Islamophobia appeared or emerged the most. The most. Mm -hmm. I listened to someone, maybe Nazia Kadi from United States. She said that the United States they they are doing the propaganda of terrorism and Islamophobia in order to make the people forget what they did in Iraq and Afghanistan. But what I ask here is that, do they have any profit on it, on propagating Islamophobia and terrorism? Because I don't think if they don't have any profit there, there are some countries which are already, the countries are already led by powerful countries. Why do they need a terrorism and Islamophobia? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, so this, this thank you for that question. It, it highlights a really important point um, in, in an important dissonance that I think that the, the popular discourse on Islamophobia really misses on. If you were to ask most people on the street, even Muslims, right, uh, they think that Islamophobia is entirely irrational, right, that it's, it's sort of deployed out of ignorance. That isn't always the case. The most damaging spearheads of Islamophobia are actually rational. They're using Islamophobia as a very stated and intended weapon Right, to, to, to sort of enable them to access economic, political incentives in the United States. It's a tool to expand American empire, yeah. right? And I think that the brother stated it perfectly, right? Um, American Islamophobia and this notion that Muslims are terrorists, right, justifies, right? It makes it e an easy sell to the American public in the broader world to launch illegal wars in Afghanistan, to launch illegal wars in places like Iraq. America is a place, I teach, again, I teach law, right, where you need evidence to incriminate somebody. 
it's, it's called this concept of due process, due process. right? You can't, you can't criminalize an individual unless you have evidence that he or she is engaged in some sort of crime. The Bush administration for years lied about Saddam Hussein. I'm not saying he's a good guy, right? I'm not making that claim. That he had weapons of mass destruction. There was no weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein was a secularist, right? He was a member of the Ba'ath Party. He had no connection to Al-Qaeda, right? But he was a brown Arab guy. In, in Western imagination, Arab means Muslim, yeah. right? He's a terrorist, an easy sell. And by selling the American public that Saddam Hussein is an Arab Muslim and equal, which equals terrorist, that enables the United States to seize all these coveted fields of oil. And not only oil, right? Oil is part of the equation, but to seize land, to entrench American dominion in the heart of the Middle East, in the heart of the Arab world. And we see the consequences of what's happened in Iraq. It's essentially three countries now. It's divided, right? We see what happened in Afghanistan, right? Using this notion of terrorism. Now, look, whether you like the thought of it or not, we can debate about that. You know what I mean? But the thought of bombs were directly connected to the war on terror, all threats of 9-11. Yeah. Maybe the Saudi regime was, but the Saudi regime is America's best friend in the region. <laughs> yeah. Right? If they go after their economic interests in Saudi Arabia, guess what? Oil prices skyrocket in the United States. So a central tenet of Islamophobia is driven by the rational interest to expand American empire and to access American political and economic interests in the region. It's rational, especially when we're talking about state-sponsored and structural Islamophobia. In the same way that anti-indigenous or Native American racism was rational, by virtue of qualifying Native Americans as savage barbarians, that enables the European colonists in the United States to seize their land. In the same way that anti-Palestinian racism is rational, by virtue of classifying Palestinians as savages and barbarians and terrorists, that enables Israel to seize their land, to make the desert bloom, and then bring in settlers today in real time to take over Palestinian homes. In the same way in the United States for a long time, right, classifying black identity as property enables the justification of chattel slavery. Racism, anti-Palestinian sentiment, Islamophobia, when it's coming from the state is rational. It's a weapon used to expand, to facilitate and enable the state to achieve its political and economic interests. You guys got me uh, excited today. I don't know how to work up. Sorry, uh, um, I think as well, Oh. Um, my question, or rather my intuition, is that um, I've, I heard the statement once and I think it really holds true when it comes to what I think is an industry that, is come out, that has come out of Islamophobia, yeah. which is that the orientalized love to orientalize the orientalized, mm -hmm. which is almost as if we've inherited this, this complex in relation to Islamophobia, in relation to racism and so forth. And you spoke about prevent before and like I, as British Muslims we face the repercussions of state-based um, Islamophobia, um, or what I like to think is another just a version of racism that I think needs more context and conversation. My, my, un, um, my question is, how do we de-essentialize Islamophobia in the way that we understand it? Because one of the issues within academia as well is that we all have this like one-size-fits-all approach to Islamophobia. And then what happens is the, the lived experience of American Muslims, or the lived experience of Mus British Muslims, overtakes what's happening in India and Uyghur and all of these other places. And I think this is really detrimental because it comes back down to this conversation of the West holding capital in relation to any conversation of discrimination, especially when it comes to Islamophobia. And I've moved around recently and I've realized that leaving Britain, the conversation of Islamophobia is so different, but the thing is we kind of, we still enable um, the essentializing of Muslim, any type of experience in the West as a holistic experience. And you said something earlier, which is that I'm American, which does not mean white. And maybe I, I, I disagree slightly, because even when I say British, even though I'm not white, my identity really facilitates white supremacy, right? So how do we challenge that when conversations of Islamophobia don't really consider um, other identities and when we as individuals are not looking to de-essentialize um, these forms of discrimination? 
Yeah. You know, that's a, that, that's a layer network of questions that I'll, I'll try my best <laughs> to answer. But if I, you know, if I don't sort of address every sort of tenet of your question, I'm, I'm happy to. But, uh, but I think you're exactly right. The spirit, of your, the spirit of your question hones in on the idea that Islamophobia, there, there's sort of an, a Western-centric discourse and orientation of the way, uh, uh, the way we, we examine and interrogate Islamophobia, broadly speaking. We sort of prioritize and privilege Western Muslim experiences to the detriment um, of Muslim experiences beyond Europe and beyond, specifically the United States. I mean, I make the argument that Islamophobia in Canada, even in South America, where it's still pervasive, uh, is neglected in the popular and the academic discourses as well. But there's sort of like, you're exactly right, this essentialization of Islamophobia uh, constructed in the image of the Western experience, which is, which is extremely problematic because the, the functional effect it has is, um, it obfuscates or entirely erases um, some of the more nefarious, right, and ominous instances of Islamophobia that are taking place across the world, some of which I've mentioned earlier, right? India, obviously, what's happened with the Rohingya Muslims, um, you know, uh, East Turkestan being another one, Islamophobia in Japan is an issue that is rising, South Korea, um, Sub-Saharan African nations as well, where Islamophobia is also an issue. But because we tend to... <coughs> There's this interesting dialectic that arises from the post-colonial experience, which tethers Islamophobia to uh, European and American colonialism. Um, and much of it is, I think, at least intellectually and academically, is tied to the dominant discourses on post-colonial theory and Islamophobia. So controlling works by the likes of people like Franz Fanon. Right? And you can't talk about Islamophobia unless you talk about Fanon, uh, Albert Memmi, Jean-Paul Sartre, Edward Said. Uh, some of the feminist scholars like uh, Fatima Mernisi, for instance. For them, these foundational scholars who people like me cite in the academic discourses were fixated specifically on the United States and on Europe. And as a consequence of that, we see the propagation of Islamophobia only being discussed in the West. What's really destructive about this, this is really academic, I apologize, but I'm, I'm, really, I'm really enjoying this uh, exchange, is um, the rise of American hegemony has resulted in the very sloppy and destructive imposition of American definitions of race and religion onto contexts where they don't belong. Right? So you see a lot of activists, for instance, talking about um, white supremacy in the United States and applying that to places like the UK, the Arab world, Germany. It doesn't belong. It doesn't work. It doesn't, exactly, it's sloppy, right? It's sloppy and it sort of distorts the experience of Muslims in those countries, right? You can't talk about white supremacy in India when we're dealing with Hindu supremacy, right? It makes no sense. We can't talk about white supremacy in East Turkestan when we're talking about Han supremacy, right? So one, one of the negative, I guess, intellectual consequences um, of, a, of the, the global war on terror is that it sort of curated this cottage industry of leftists yeah. who I think have their hearts in the right place, right? But as a consequence of being more um, <coughs> pundits than thinkers, yeah. They're imposing really destructive American concepts into contexts where they don't belong. So I just like I'm, I'm going to finish it because I, I also don't want to make an academic discussion. But what I would say is that if but I'd love for you to co-author an article with me. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a pleasure. Um, but my interest in this conversation does come from post-colonial studies because studying up in the West, and I think, and you know, like I think it's unfair to have this conversation here because my experience is so different within Western academia studying in a British institution. Yeah. But my first interaction with anything outside of like the, the knowledge uh, knowledge belongs to the West was in, in university when I first had a post-colonial seminar and my mind was blown, right? And you know, it's really sad that this is the case, but I think that the reason why this conversation is important is because a lot of these post-colonial thinkers, they started off doing something really important, but what we see as time progresses is that as you move left or even um, assume a leftist identity within politics, you have to, um, almost disassociate yourself from religion, and yes. as a Muslim academic, I find myself within, especially British Muslim, um, sorry, British academic institutions, having to say that I don't subscribe to religion when talking about academia, which I think is so counterintuitive to post-colonial studies. And I think if we look at Franz Fanon and we look at all of these other thinkers, the best way to approach Islamophobia, in my personal opinion, from an academic standpoint, is to use um, post-colonial theory. And I think almost. 
in my opinion, post-colonial scholars in this day and age are also Islamophobic because mm. of their approach to religion as anything but biased or um, unintellectual or uh, or unable to mm. be objective. And even the conversation of objectivity is like is, is, is something else. But I think that once we um, interrogate what Islamophobia is for each community of people, and this is what I mean, like decentralization for every single concept, decentralization even in our understanding of discrimination is actually really important in trying to like even approach the conversation of how do we create solutions for problems. Because this idea of globalization is a ribbon the soul, because now we use this approach to every single question, which is how do we combat Islamophobia? This conversation here in Turkey needs to be different to the conversation in America or in, in Britain, right? But the thing is, because we have so much agency and because of my British accent, unfortunately, when I start talking about these things, suddenly everyone assumes that I can create the solutions both in the academic sphere and in the activist sphere. And I think passing on the mic or broadening the conversation or saying, actually, we don't have the answers. I don't know what the solution is to your community. And facilitating that might be the first step towards these conversations. Yeah. No, I, if I can respond really quickly to that, I, 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 I echo everything you say. And I think that, look, I, you know, I'm somebody who grows out of the, the post colonial tradition. <laughs> Critical race theory is a spawn of post colonial theory. Um, <coughs> but these scholars that we cite, and even Edward Said, right, there's criticism of Edward Said that are warranted, right? So he was um, Arab centric in his analysis of Orientalism, right? Sort of neglects the experience of of Islam and Muslims beyond the Arab world, per se, as a consequence of his lived experience. Um, I, I think so the point I want to address, uh, there's a really salient one, and that one that really resonates with me is you're exactly right. Even though scholars like us examining Islamophobia in the West are doing it within liberal circles, those liberal circles can be just as Islamophobic because they're wed uh, to the broader sort of project of secularism, or in some respects in the United States, to be frank with you, um, you know, far liberal, uh, liber uh, you know, far liberal progressive intellectual traditions mm -hmm. are atheist and agnostic, mm -hmm. and they view Islam with great suspicion and great skepticism as well, because they view it as being inimical to women's rights, they view it to be inimical uh, to rights around sexuality, which is a cornerstone of uh, liberal, inle liberal intellectual traditions. So the bad news is that people like you and I don't have uh, real intellectual homes. Because the right hates us, right? The, and the left might, like Biden, right? They might pretend that they like us because they want to put the hijab a woman on banners and posters and sell, you know, Nike hijab to young consumers. Yeah. Liberal Islamophobia is very damaging and very frightening because it's less conspicuous. So the re reality is this: is discussions like this one that we're having today are critical because at this juncture it's important for us to build. And that's why I'm really excited that you have your publishing house. We have to build our own academic and intellectual circles which don't view Islam and criticism of Islamophobia as being inimical and oppositional. But I can talk to you all day long about this stuff. Thank you. We were expecting that. Bismillah, <laughs> assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Ilke and Roj, for hosting Professor Bedu, and welcome to Islamo. You are an inspiration for many of us, uh, professor, uh, scholar activists like you. Uh, we follow you on social media for all the good work, especially for Indian illegal in Occupy Jumu and Kashmir. Uh, myself, Riyaz, I belong to that region. Uh, I have three questions, okay. if Brother Hassan allows me. I'll first come let's, back. Let's, let's put it short and short. Let's give, give everyone. I'll try to, of course, but uh, I think, and please uh, uh, pardon me if. Uh, I missed the read. Uh, first things first, uh, this uh, Islamophobia that we uh, get to hear from our academicians or activists the Mus from, from the Muslim uh, community in Northern America especially, is it an awakening that one morning, one fine morning, the Muslim community the Americas or the Europe, they woke up and they saw Trump there. First, why I'm saying is because all the bad things that happened outside the borders of what constitutes America are Muslim lands. And the community 
the Muslim community, I'm sorry with all due respect, but I just want to understand this thing. This hula bula from West about Islamophobia, does the Muslim community feel this need to also acknowledge that the regimes that they voted in power in America or the West, they also voted for them, be it Obama, now the Biden, or the Trump. What is that? I link it with India, and I, I would, uh, it would be great to hear from you. The biggest Islamophobia industry in the world is now India. We, did not, we do not get to see literature on how India evolved as a laboratory of Islamophobia, which is backed by state. One is that. Second, India has been illegally, with its military might, occupying Kashmir for the past 75 years. But we did not get to see the way the Muslim community, especially in the West, is so active now regarding the slow genocide under this low-intensity Modi regime yeah. happening in India, expressing concern. But why were, why? Why was there this silence for the past 70 years? The last one, I believe your good self also follows what, is, what happened in Pakistan in the past one and a half month. Yeah. Many accuse ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan of using religion to trouble his image. For me, he's not an Islamist, he's totally not. His concept of human development, he takes inspiration from Riyasat e Madina Munawara. That's a different thing, but he's not a declared Islamist. Do you think Islamophobia also played a role in this U.S. orchestrated regime change in Pakistan? Why? Before you answer to it. When we see those who are illogizing the so-called constitutionalism that threw him out of this power in Pakistan, it, is, it consists of those who illogize it, those who support it, it consists of the, the opposition parties, along with that, the elite across the political, social, educational, media, academics, those borders. Thank you very much. Well, it's your prompted to uh, answer the question, mm -hmm. but my humble request to everyone, mm -hmm. if you will try to correlate you know, everything, we would have you know, thousands of questions here. So we, we may stick to the real topic, you know, which was discussed today, yeah. and the core of it, it would be helpful. You know, it's not personal, just a humble request, because there are a lot of people who probably want to ask the question. Okay, so now the floor is... Yeah, there, there, there were a series of questions okay. there. I'll try to address a couple of them. What, was Islamophobia, or the fight against Islamophobia, uh, an, an awakening uh, for Muslims, in, in some respects, it was right. I think that 9/11 was a was a sobering wake-up call, for, not only for Muslim Americans but for Muslims across the world, to understand that uh, the United States had this very vested campaign to police Muslims across the world, and there needed to be done. There needed something to be done uh, to stand up against what the United States was doing with regard to explicit form of war policy, aligning itself with governments that were cracking down on Muslim populations across the world. So you see this renaissance and reawakening taking place, and that's a great thing, and it's, it's, it's needed. Uh, look, I'll, 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 there was like maybe four or five questions there, but, you know, but I, what I, I wanted to address Kashmir. I think, I think what took place in Kashmir is largely the failing of the broader global Muslim milieu and population, because I'll, I'll say this. When Modi marched into Kashmir in 2019, no Muslim intellectuals, academics, pundits, politicians made any noise about what took place in Kashmir. It wasn't an issue of advocacy. It wasn't an issue of activism. I didn't see uh, newspapers addressing what was happening in Kashmir. It was ignored. And we can blame the West and the BBC and the Guardian for not addressing it. We can blame Hindu supremacy. But it's also our failure if we're not addressing it ourselves. So we have to own that, you know? I think a lot of Muslims, old and young, we like to point our finger, but seldom point the finger on ourselves. Yeah. Nobody talks about Kashmir. 
Everybody talks about Palestine, and it's great that they talk about Palestine. Right? Nobody started talking about Yemen yeah. until four or five years ago. So we have to do away with this, like, pecking order. Yeah. And I'm Arab, right? I'm not a nationalist. I'm not an Arab nationalist by any means. Like, you know, I don't care. Like, I was born with an Egyptian mom and a Lebanese father. Right? But to me, if a Muslim is being persecuted and being cracked down, it's our obligation regardless of where they are to speak up. But the reality is that we have a pecking order which is largely based on Arab centrism, right? Mm -hmm. The issues that everybody addresses take place in the Arab world, and the issues that don't matter take place beyond the Arab world. Mm -hmm. So, again, there's like three or four more questions, but uh, <laughs> for sake of addressing the others, it's important. So, Anis, Anis, maybe have the mic here. This brother's hand up for a little bit. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Yeah. And slowly we are yeah, moving towards concluding and so I mean from now on was it will be first serve, first first come first serve was this No need to Thank you very much indeed for thank you very much indeed for uh, this uh, wonderful brief and uh, the work and for the work you've been doing. Uh, I would like to come back to the practical solutions and I need to seek your advice at a practical level to Muslim individuals as well as. Muslim institutions yeah. in the West. Mm -hmm. I lived in Canada for 50 years, and I know everything in the States. Of course, most of my life in Canada, I, I have been traveling to speak in the States, and so I know everything in the States. And, in the and, in. and I feel that uh, Muslims who live in uh, Western countries have three options. Either to fully assimilate or completely isolate or intelligently integrate. And I, I think this intelligent integration is what we need to emphasize uh, more. So do you have any practical advice for Muslim individuals living in the West, Muslim institutions working in the West, as how to intelligently integrate to maximize the benefits and to avoid uh, the negatives of, of Islamophobia that's happening uh, very, very bad right now. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, I like that typology constructed, uh, and I agree with you. I think that um, intelligent and strategic integration uh, is the optimal strategy for a range of reasons, because there's always going to be Muslims living in the West. Not every Muslim has the ability, the resources, the, the privilege to pick up and move to Turkey, to Egypt. You know, Detroit, where I live, is a large, poor, and working class Muslim population, right? Um, I myself come from like a very humble Muslim American family. They don't have the, we left because of war. And we have no other choice but to live in the United States, right? But strategic integration uh, is key. Integration is not assimilation, right? And, and assimilation is a bad word. Yeah. Assimilation means that you're essentially sacrificing your identity your native identity for the host country's identity. Integration, on the other hand, is to say, I'm gonna maintain who I am as a Muslim, right? And sort of adapt to this context in ways that are amenable and aligned with my religious and social and you know, traditional sensibilities. Um, but it has to be intelligent, right? What I tell young people all the time is, I don't think Muslims should work for the Department of Defense. I don't think Muslims should serve in the US military. I don't think that Muslims should work for the American military uh, industrial complex. I don't think Muslims should work, and this is really controversial. I know a lot of Muslim brothers working in banking, you know, praying five times a day and uh, doing a bunch of great things, you know what I mean? Yeah. But working for these huge corporations which are financially feeding and enabling the government in very insidious ways to decimate Muslim communities across the world, right? There's strategic integration but there's also strategic divestments from institutions and entities that are committed and invested in policing and punishing our communities. 
right? So let me tell you. So for me, I was a practicing lawyer, right? And I had the option of being a partner at a major British law firm and you know make make a lot. Of, I was making a lot of money, right, as a young lawyer, right? But I realized, and especially after the 9/11 uh, terror attacks, what is the best way in which I can deconstruct and demystify what future influential people? Uh, think about Islam, right? My law I teach constitutional law. I'm a Muslim that teaches constitutional law. That has a very dissonant effect. My, the majority of my students are, are white and Christian. When they walk in and their professor teaching them constitutional law is named Khali Ali Baidun, <laughs> right? <laughs> Not George Johnson or, you know, Jennifer Smith. That has a destabilizing effect, right? They're going to be judges. They're going to be lawyers. They're going to be prosecutors. And they're learning American law from the Muslim. That's the kind of strategic integration we need. Muslims moving into spaces when we can, we're not going to change the system entirely, right? But we can strategically inflect and influence the system in ways that work for us. Especially, especially, this is one thing I'm really committed to. In the United States, few people know this, right? 35% of the Muslim American population is poor or below poor. In France, something like 50% of the Muslim population is below the poverty line. 60 to 70 percent of incarcerated individuals, people in pr prisons in France, are Muslims, right? If they don't have Muslim attorneys, if they don't have Muslim judges, if they don't have Muslim politicians defending their rights, then their condition is going to get worse. They don't have the ability to go back to Algeria because it's been decimated by French colonialism. Afghan refugees don't have the ability to go back to Afghanistan, right? Uber brothers and sisters don't have the ability to go back to China. Many of them are living in Western, Western countries. We have an obligation as Muslims to make these places more comfortable and safer for these, especially the very vulnerable Muslim population. And I love the way you put it, and I'm going to take that, but I'm going to give you credit for teaching the Salaam alaikum, Professor and everyone. Thank you for this inspirational talk. Actually, my question is related to... Is it working? Uh, so again, alaikum. So my question is related to um, how do you think uh, the American government or the American regime is trying to preach Islamophobia among Muslims? Because uh, among American Muslims, let's yeah. say all Muslims who live in the West, because we talked about Islamophobia like um, preaching or marketing Islamophobia to Westerns or non-Muslims. But I think it's really um, critical and dangerous if Muslims themselves start to um, be influenced by Islamophobia. So are there any efforts um, that are going in America um, to uh, preach or promote this? Because uh, we talk about, you know, the good Muslim, the bad Muslim, and uh, if we watch the media like Netflix and this stuff, we, we see that there are many efforts to create these very wrong, um, images or assimilations of, of Muslims yeah. um, in the West. So uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? And thank you very much. Yeah, so the, the, the sister in the back, who I spoke to earlier, brought, brought a really important point up that, uh, you know, I, I think one of the most lasting and damaging effects of Orientalism and Islamophobia is the sort of like psychological ingraining of Islamophobia amongst Muslims, especially in the West. To say that in order for you to achieve success, upward mobility, assimilation, you have to sort of shed and undress yourself of your Muslim yeah. identity, yeah. right? Um, so I'll, let me give you an example. When I worked for a law firm right out of law school, right, everybody went to happy hour. You guys know yeah. what happy hour is? Yeah. Right? It's not when you go and hang out with friends. You go there and drink right yeah. after work, right? Yeah. And these happy hours are where the big cases, the big relationships with the partners at the law firm happened, yeah. right? So I can make, at that juncture, I was like, okay, I'm Muslim, I don't drink, right? There's an ultimatum, essentially, that if I wanna advance my career and become friends with these partners and get these really important cases, I gotta go to happy hour, yeah. right? Yeah. And I gotta shed my Muslim identity to advance my professional career, right? Sure. So these are ultimatums that exist, right, in, in, the, in the West. And that's just one common example that there's this, like, perpetual process. Um, you know, it's coming from the state, but it's also coming subtly from corporate actors, individuals, um, to, to not behave Muslim, whatever that means, yeah. to not speak 
uh, Muslim languages like Arabic or Urdu or, yeah. um, you know, in professional context because that's not professional. Yeah. Um, so this process of Islamophobic uh, colonization is historic, but it's also, it takes place today. One thing that really friends me today, and you see it on social media in real time, is uh, you can call it religious capitalism. Yeah. Right, that huge yeah. corporations are seizing on specific expressions of Muslim identity yeah. uh, to sell products, right? Uh, so there's tokenization of hijab, exactly. for instance, yeah. from companies like Nike, uh, Adidas, yeah. and so forth and so on, to sort of strip Muslim identity yeah. into like a mascot. Yeah. That's you know kind of not connected to a religious or a spiritual sure. tradition, to kind of align it with liberal sort of like sensibilities of what being a religious minority art. We want, we want the Mahajabah wearing the Nike, yeah. but we don't want the customs, customs. and traditions yeah. that come along with that. So there's a lot of frightening things happening with regard to how Islam... Actually, we don't want Mahajabah wearing Nike, because Nike is uh, being produced in the legal camps. Yeah, they're so subcontracting. That's how the sisters be aware of that. Yeah, that's how so what, what company... Puma, they're designing... Puma, they're... they're <laughs> 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 Puma, Let's encourage everyone to start up uh, their own business. Yeah, they start like native Muslim yeah. uh, brands. So you want to make sure the ones in the corner are not sleeping. Oh. So, so that's the uh, summary. Uh, 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 there's this notion that Islam is simply compatible, incompatible with the contemporary world uh, because of its uh, inability to adjust. I genuinely want to know your answer to this notion. And if uh, we, uh, the Islamic world needs to increase its flexibility to adjust, then to what extent do we need to increase its flexibility? I'll be short and brief. I think that notion that Islam is incompatible with the modern world is BS. Right? It's, it's, it's based on stereotypes. It's based on you know, this you know, very hateful notion uh, that only Christianity yeah. Judaism. What's really trick. What's really funny is this: is that nobody talked about Judaism or the Western tradition until the creation of Israel. Judaism mm -hmm. was viewed with the same, you know, in some respects, the same degree of suspicion and skepticism as Islam mm -hmm. until 1948. Jews in the United States were considered white until the creation of Israel. So mm -hmm. l let's be honest. I think that we have to give credit to Jewish brothers and sisters who are a smaller population than us. <laughs> Right? Yeah. To make the cell that Judaism is this, yeah. you know, good religion that can be adjusted and adapted. We don't want to adapt to the West. We don't want to adjust to Western sensibilities and Western religion. That, that shouldn't be the aim. Right? They're not our judges. Who cares what they say? Right? But the idea is that Islam in and of itself innately has given rise to some of the highest you know, forms of civilization, intellectual production um, in the world. So what we have to do to restore that is... To, to fix our house, right? Make, you know, fix our issue. We've got a lot of issues, division along racial, ethnic lines, political lines, rivalries between nation states. Yeah. And I'll be frank, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a Turkey, but nation states are just as complicit as manipulating religion for political purposes. And that's destructive for the interests of the human, right? So there's a lot to say, but uh, we should never compare ourselves to the West. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I was done with the question, but there is uh, one more question from our um, general manager, so I wanted to ask. Um, he's asking that, um, would it be uh, possible to talk about a phobia of islamophobia, uh, which means, um, uh, is it possible to talk about a situation where Muslims are being too sensitive about islamophobia? <coughs> Uh, when there is actually no Islamophobia or any hatred towards uh, specific Muslims. So, there is, like, do you uh, see there is a misuse in this usage of um, Islamophobia in some of the communities? Yeah. No! <laughs> no, 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 I think we got to speak about Islamophobia more. So, like, in my country, right, we have this architecture of Islamophobic law and policy that's been assembled in the post 9 11 context just so to say that we're too sensitive to wars in afghanistan and iraq drone strikes in somalia and pakistan and afghanistan right the patriot act sharia bans being enacted and established across 50 states in the united states 
right? Terror watch lists, no fly lists, the Muslim ban, the Muslim registry. Trump talked about enacting a Muslim registry, this database where he's going to track everywhere Muslims come and go. Well, guess what? Obama did that. Right? It was called NSEER, the National Security Entry and Exit Registration System that existed. So how can you be sensitive when you have this architecture of Islamophobia in the United States? How can you be sensitive to Islamophobia when we got 5 million Uber and concentration camps? How can you be sensitive to Islamophobia when the homes of Muslim, uh, of Muslim Indians are being bulldozed in real time? And Modi just enacted a law called the Citizenship Amendment Act, which is the Indian version of the Muslim ban that restricts Muslims from Muslim majority countries to become naturalized citizens of India. How can we become too how can we be too sensitive when Modi is building concentration camps in the state of Assam to place Indian Muslim citizens without documentation that they're citizens into prison camps like Uber brothers and sisters in East Turkestan? How can you be sensitive to that? You can only be sent insensitive to that if you're ignorant to what's taking place to Muslims across the world. Look, I'm not somebody who likes to play the quote-unquote victim card, right? I don't like to be a victim. I, I grew up boxing. I, you know, I like to fight. If somebody tried to victimize me, I'm going to make sure they leave in worse condition than, than they left me. <laughs> so trust me, I don't like playing the victim card by any means. Right? But what's worse than being a victim is being ignorant. And we can't be ignorant to what's taking place across the world. From the last 100 questions, welcome. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you so much, Professor Pedro. I had a comment and a question. The first it has to do with um, the brother over there from Kashmir. He said something very interesting. He said so-called constitutionalism. And I think most people in this room who are not from the West can actually agree or could probably agree with me that we live in a very charged political context around the world um, where you cannot um, rely on justice advocates due process. And in such situations, speaking of Islamophobia is no longer um, the priority, perhaps. Uh, perhaps in Turkey, for example, where the bigger conversation ends up being secularism in the nation state affecting Muslims, um, not only in Turkey, but I think around the world. So I think, I mean, you are based in the States. You consider justice, you know, your, the necessity of justice as a due process. But if you were to give advice for us as youth um, living in parts of the world where that's not a given, absolutely not a given, and where you're living in political, economic, social you know, context where um, you know, it's so deeply entrenched, um, where the Islamophobia is so deeply entrenched that it's no longer even a conversation to begin with, yeah. then what would you have to add to that? Uh, there's so much to unpack from there, but I think that you, you I think that the sort of like broad observation you constructed is sort of tied to the idea that Islamophobia in authoritarian countries is far more oppressive and ominous than it could be potentially in quote unquote democratic Western nations. And I think that's the case. So if we look at Islamophobia in places like China, right, authoritarian regimes where the, there's no semblance or modicum of free speech, free exercise of religion. Right, individual rights or liberties, no freedom of assembly, no freedom of no media. Right? That Islamophobia is this entire oppressive blanket that disables any kind of resistance to what the state is doing. We see that happening in real time in East Turkestan, right? That is a more destructive form of Islamophobia, in my opinion. So now we're approaching this like global moment where China is emerging to be the primary adversary to the United States on the geopolitical stage. This might not be a popular opinion, but I'll give it to you. I, I'm, I'm far more frightened of Chinese hegemony than I am American hegemony. Because the authoritarian model is one that suffocates and suppresses any form of resistance. I'm Egyptian, and I'm going to Egypt this summer, but I'm afraid that I might get arrested if I go. <laughs> because I'm, I'm being honest, I'm, that's not a joke. Because Egypt is an authoritarian state that is staunchly Islamophobic. Their suppression of the Muslim Brotherhood has had, has had the collateral effect where anybody who is perceived to be an Ikhwani, right? And that perception is sloppy. You wear a beard, you wear the hijab, you go to this masjid, you got a cousin you know, who might have been part of the Brotherhood at one juncture, right? That kind of association, that kind of authoritarian regime, which is Islamophobic in its posture, in my opinion, 
suffocates any form of resistance. And you said something that I think is really prescient. It's the idea that I think secularism is far more um, frightening as a catalyst of Islamophobia than Christ Christian centrism or white supremacy. Because the enshrinement, so secularism isn't only an aversion to religion, it itself is an ideological religion, right? It's the notion that God or the divine doesn't belong in the establishment of the state. So you have godlessness, which is being enshrined in the enactment of the state. And France is the most stark example, right? Aversion to religion at large, specifically Islam being the principal threat to secularism in places across Europe. The rising secularism in the United States. The United States used to be a Christian country. It's now becoming a secular country. So secularism, to me, is far more frightening a front against Islamophobia than Christianity, white supremacy in the West. Hi. Sorry, I had a question. Um, I, sorry, I, I really like this discussion anyway, but I had a question regarding, I guess, Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality. Yeah. and how it's being implemented in different countries. I think one thing that the majority of us may have seen from today is that Islamophobia is defined and is practiced differently in different contexts. In Egypt, in China, in America, in the UK with the prevent policy. Um, it's clearly different in different contexts. And how can we adopt intersectionality without it being reductive simply because there's so much complex history um interactions and different policies and legislations in different countries so i guess that would be the first question and sorry the second one would be in regards to um your approach and i i i guess from my understanding correct me if i'm wrong you focus a lot on different countries uh india in regards to for example kashmir um, sorry, uh, I don't know if that's problematic. If that's you. Sorry, um, in, in regards to Kashmir um, and in many different countries as well. Um, but to what extent are you also incorporating a more participatory approach? Because I guess from what I've understood, you focus a lot on different countries, which is good. But to what extent are you also? working with local experts and participating with local knowledge and local people who have experienced these struggles and incorporating that within your own research. Yeah. So the first question, Kim, Kim Crenshaw is my mentor. Mm -hmm. So I, I know Kim really well, and Kim is the mother of intersectionality. And there's a lot of distortion as to what intersectionality actually means, right? I, I see a lot of advocates and activists uh, misrepresenting and misusing the term. So let's start with a foundational definition of what intersectionality is. Right? Intersectionality is this idea that individuals with multiple sets of subordinate identities experience animus in distinct ways. So the classic example that Crenshaw uses in her uh, foundational work is that black women um, experience uh, sexism and experience anti-black racism uh, in convergent ways which intensifies the subordination they experience. So my work is staunchly intersectional. I'm an intersectionalist in the sense that I highlight the fact that um, Uber Muslims living in China as a consequence of this distinct ethnicity and religion will experience Islamophobia differently than an American Muslim. When we look at the American, or even, I'll give you the British context. So a Somali Brit, as a consequence of being East African and being Muslim, experiences Islamophobia as a, as a result of that distinct identity, then let's, let's say she's a female in the 60s, right? Distinctly then a... Um, white male revert to Islam, right? So Islamophobia is not, and that's why I, I construct Islamophobia as a theory, a theoretical paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to understand a theory before you apply the way uh, it, 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 it uh, uh, unfolds in practice. The second uh, observation uh, is an important one, right? So I, I'm an American law scholar. My, my principal area of expertise and focus is American national security and constitutional law. Uh, but as a consequence of my public work on Islamophobia, I've done a lot of research on what's happening on a global scale, right? And what I've done with this book is, before the pandemic, I spent six months traveling the world, speaking to local 
victims, experts, academics, journalists in places like, I went to Rajasthan in India, I spent, spent a month in France on in the Banglis, sort of the, the Arab and Muslim ghettos on the outskirts of Paris, went to the UK, um, uh, spoke to Rohingya, refugees across the world, uh, getting their direct testimonies. My next book, inshallah, will have a, a lot of direct testimony and interviews from individuals who directly experience Islamophobia. The reality is this, right? The reality is that, look, and I think it would be remiss not to acknowledge that by me living in the West, that comes with a lot of privilege. Being American and being male and being an academic gives me a platform that not a lot of individuals have. And I'm very keen on using that platform to amplify the voices of individuals who don't have that platform. And that's what, inshallah, I'm trying to do with this next book. Inshallah. Uh, you know, one question, then the last one, <laughs> Just press, there's a button on Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's keep it short. Yeah. So I'm from Myanmar, where uh, I'm from Myanmar, where even a lot of Muslims don't even know Myanmar or the like Rohingya genocide. So uh, one of the issues that I face is where Muslims are not allowed to intellectually integrate into a society. Where Muslims are not allowed to be in office. Muslims are not allowed to uh, run uh, to be governors. To have you know like really uh, positions of power, uh, and also our families tell us not to be interested in these situations where we are. Where my family, for example, told me not to be interested in politics, not to be interested in raising our voices for oppression. How do we tackle this? How do we tackle the Islamophobia of the state and the Islamophobia of our families? How do we? Great question. Yeah. Okay, let's take the question together and then you ask one more. Yeah. Can you take your question? Yeah. Uh, I have to be some. You need to throw it for me. I'm sorry, it's not uh, good. Uh, we have more friends. Uh, I wanted to ask about the concept that it's really uh, spread and one of the most was great investment. Yeah. So, uh, in France, it's very um, theory that is really a predominant in the public debates, even like yeah. uh, during the election, it was like really maybe the number one subject um, uh, talked about. I want to know uh, is it like in America, because uh, it's like well known as in French, because uh, I don't hear about it a lot, but uh, when I hear about this church and the, yeah. the terrorist attack in uh, It's only at the time that I hear that uh, the person who is the terrorist was like uh, inspired by this uh, concept. So I don't know. Uh, uh, what can you tell us about this concept uh, in America? And also, yes. how are we supposed to? Okay. In, I'm not going to say fight, but we don't have another word. Uh, uh, this idea that more than uh, Islam is just in the religion that they don't like or religion that are going to attack them, which is like it is a religion that are going to replace them yeah. and that in uh, really near future. I think we have, can, I, can I take these two questions together? Because there's a really interesting yes. question. I'll, I'll come back to this other question. So I'm really, I'm really glad the sister brought this notion, this discourse of the, the great replacement theory that ties really nicely to the brother's uh, comment really early on. You know, you know who Paladin is, right? The Islamophobe from Denmark. This guy gallivanting across the world, uh, specifically in Scandinavia, burning massage, you know, burning, burning the Qurans and plotting himself in front of mosques, uh, you know, rising up, you know, uh, not only what European supremacists, Islamophobes in these distinct countries. Scan so Scandinavia is another place where Islamophobia is prevalent, but that is seldom addressed, driven by this great replacement theory, 
right? Which is a global sort of discourse that's been adopted by populists and white supremacists across the world. This, this idea, everybody knows what the Great Replacement Theory is. It's the notion largely held by, by Europeans, by global whites, that not only Muslims, by the way, immigrants at large are moving en masse into white majority states uh, and replacing the white natives of those states. <laughs> And it's not entirely racial, and how whiteness is sort of framed is along religious lines, right? So there's this broader process that Islam de-whites individuals who are European, Bosnia being a classic example of that, right? Um, so the global tie is this. A couple of days ago in the United States where I live, an 18-year-old walked into a uh, grocery store in Buffalo, New York, and shot up a largely black uh, grocery store driven by his manifesto being written inciting the Great Replacement Theory. This is a global discourse that's been adopted by white supremacists, populists, Islamophobes, xenophobes across the world. Muslims aren't the only targets of Great Replacement Theory. Muslims are the principal targets in Europe. But in the United States, it's Muslims, it's Latinos, black people who are the targets of the Great Replacement Theory. Uh, and in Scandinavia, obviously, it's very pervasive in that propaganda. Um, so it's charging what's, it's also, it's also charging governments, and like, I mean, politicians. Like you said, candidates like Eric Zemmour, yeah. the far-right candidate, you know, essentially adopted Great Replacement Theory as the focus of his, of his uh, campaign, right? Eric Zemmour was even far more Islamophobic than the, the Front National, the, the Fed, right? Saying things that want to ban Muslim names, the headscarf ban should be adopted categorically across the country. Uh, you have people in Australia, New Zealand, politicians saying the same thing. You've got Turkish secularists adopting dimensions of this discourse here in the country in which we, we sit and stand. Um, so great replacement theory in, in, in large or in part is driving a lot of the Islamophobic discourses across the world. It's yes. something we have to contend with. I think yeah, yeah. Of my, no, no, okay? no. Salam alaikum. My name is Tamim. I am a, a journalist from Kashmir. Unfortunately, rendered useless by the occupation, so we can't publish on Kashmir anymore. My, I've been interestingly following you for a quite long time on Twitter, and I've seen uh, the amount of uh, support you have shown, especially for people of Kashmir, Palestine, Afghanistan. But uh, the question is, over the last 70 years, with all the systems you want is Palestine and Kashmir. We've seen a lot of people who have migrated to the West, and uh, the continuous narrative is that in the West you're able to make change minds. But for the last 70 years, there's nothing happening on the ground for the people to see any glimpse of hope. So do you see that uh, in spite of them staying back and trying to help their people, which is, I know is difficult, there's a huge brain drain. So the pride brings on the West, and nothing is happening. Thank you so much. You know, that's, that's fascinating, that's more observation than question, to be frank with you, because one, you know, one, of the more ne one of the more neglected dimensions of ethnic cleansing and genocide is, is the brain drain effect, is that you're sort of sending out the most talented, promising um, segments of Kashmiri, Uber, Palestinian society from outside of the nation where you're needed most, right, where self-determination movements are needed most um, into countries where two things are happening, right? People are afraid, and the brother asked a question about parents, right? So my parents' generation, the reason they would tell us not to become political and vocal is because they come from countries where if you're political and vocal, yeah. you're incarcerated, you're jailed. If somebody shows up to your house at 2 a.m. in the morning. At least brother was told not to speak, we were told not to point fingers, you'll be shot dead. So. Exactly, yeah. because that's, and, you know, our parents are wrong for thinking that because our parents, where the lucky ones were able to flee, where their loved ones were jailed, killed, yeah. and worse. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a destructive sort of effect of ethnic cleansing and genocide of the brain drain effect, where people become fearful to speak when they're in the West, or second, they become conditioned by the West. Yeah. They become individualistic. They forget yeah. their home countries to say that, okay, Kashmir is, I don't live in Kashmir anymore. I'm gonna achieve the American, the Canadian, the European dream and make a good life, life for myself. Look, one of the, one of the cancers of Western liberal thought, and specifically capitalism, and why social media is so frightening, in my opinion, to young people, 
is this emphasis on individualism. Right? This idea that if I succeed, that's all that matters. Where in the Kashmiri tradition, you know, the Egyptian tradition, the Islamic tradition, which are communal in nature, right? It, it smacks against this individualistic sort of outcome of capitalism and consumerism. And I think that those are the two things, to be honest with you, that you, why you don't see a lot of fight for the Kashmiri struggle. But I think this notion should change. Like, people go to the West, yeah. it's not changing anything. Yeah. It's not making any difference, so why make it happen? It's making a difference for themselves and their families, exactly. but it's not making a difference for the broader collective. Okay, I think, thank you. I think that's it for today. So, despite it being a very beautiful session, we do call it a day now, inshallah. So, inshallah, we'll finish it here. Uh, just a couple of things. I would like to thank all of you individually for gracing the occasion for you know taking the struggle to come here. Despite the rain, you know, uh, being here, and <laughs> many thanks to you, especially <laughs> coming all over from the United States and you know, not missing the event here. It's been beautiful, it was very thoughtful, enlightening. And lastly, uh, every month or fortnightly, we do a similar events here at NK. Mm -hmm. So, in case you don't get the updates about that, there's a list of names which is available outside. So, if you're interested in getting the updates about the events, and you want to be part of them. Not just the events, but also the research which is going on here. You can drop your name and your contact number or your email address. So you will automatically start getting the emails from us then, inshallah. Jazakallah, everyone.